We are in Revelation 21. Almost done, man. It's been a journey through here, huh? Right? Revelation 21. Got a lot to cover today, so we're going to jump into this thing. Um, Have you, I should say how, everybody has, how have you experienced newness in your life? How have you experienced restoration in your life? Coming as spring. People think bursting back into life. I love it. Newness. We get to visibly see newness every spring, don't we? It starts off with sneezing. (laughs) Yeah, Daniel. Repentance. What happens when we repent? Sometimes we can feel a weight gone because we know we just cleared the slate. And it, feel, it feels good to have that, right? To have a clean slate. What else? Being saved. Being saved. Speaking of clean slates, heck yeah. yeah that's huge, right? Yeah, finding peace with salvation, absolute peace for the first time in a lot of ways, right? An inner peace, a peace that nobody can take away. No thing can take it away because the peace that God gives is different than what the world gives, right? Giving your love to Christ, yeah. Amen. Uh, Sometimes we experience newness and restoration when, uh, you know, uh, well, you know what it is? It's our debts being paid. That's the biggest thing. We know our debts are paid, man. We are we are uh, in perfect fellowship with God. You got one more? When you got baptized, you experienced that newness and restoration. That's awesome. Yes, absolutely. Some of you are going to be experiencing that again on uh, uh, next Sunday, right? You know, be able to experience that in a new way. And there's it, praise God for His newness that He brings, right? Praise God for the restoration. Because sometimes you remember restoration happens when things are broken down and when they're messed up and when they need to be fixed. And don't we need to be fixed, church? (laughs) Right? I'm not the only one, right? We need to, We at times we get broken. Life happens to us. We get messed up. We get dinged up. We get low energy and we're burdened and frustrated and discouraged and all those things. And God, the good news is, is that God wants to speak life into those things. He wants to restore and he wants to bring newness. And that's what we're going to be looking at here in Revelation 21 is that God makes all things new. Amen. God makes all things new. So let's look at verse 1 of chapter 21. This is this is after the seven years of tribulation. This is after the second coming of Jesus. This is after the thousand years ruling and reigning with Jesus on earth. This is after uh, hell has been emptied into the everlasting lake of fire and uh, the great white throne judgment, the thronos in, in Greek, the, where the non-believers appear there and they are judged according to their works and sentenced uh, for eternal torment. Uh, this is after that. Now, so it's like we, God has now dealt with sin. Once and for all, it's done. It's put away. The only people there now are his kids. It's just his kids in resurrected bodies. So the sinful flesh of ours is the the thoughts, the worry, the fear, the anxiety, the bad thoughts and all those different things that's gone. Even the desire to do the wrong things is gone. It's You have a new body, a new creation. God makes all things new and that's part of that new body. Oh, amen to that, right? So that's where we're at here. So check this out. Verse 1, chapter 21. John, writing the words that uh, Jesus says to write, writing the things that he saw in this heavenly vision while he was on the island of Patmos at age 95, right? In his 90s, I should say. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Sorry for you deep sea fishermen. (laughs) Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So what we're seeing here, guys, is basically God pushing the reset button on all of creation. And does it, when we see creation, when we see creation, don't we look around and see brokenness? It doesn't take much. You drive around and you see someone who's strung out on drugs, alcohol. You see homeless. You see all kinds of things going on. A mess where there's pain and sorrow and grief and disease and all kinds of you you go and you want to plant a garden what do you have to deal with weeds and bugs and insects that eat it right and and and, and rodents and rabbits ah, it's like they're so cute but oh, stay out of my garden right <laughs> god it's, it's it's all part of the fall and now here we are at the end of everything sin has been dealt with but now we still have this world creation the universe right we see, we see energy being broken down. The second law of thermodynamics is, is part of the fall of creation, where things break down. Usable energy gets dispersed, right? Like things, things are moved from a state of order to a state of disorder. It's one of the evidences against evolution, by the way. <laughs> we only see that things move to a state of disorder. <laughs> Leave something out. You know, I've got, we've got a, uh, yeah, entropy. We've got a umbrella out on our deck, you know, and it's starting to, you know, fade because the sun just beats down on it. I was taking a grill cover off yesterday, you know, and I'm like, dang, that thing's getting faded already. It's only been like two months. The sun just beating down. It just destroys things, right? That's the world we live in. So now God is dealing now with his universe, his creation, his painting. He's touching up his painting. And what he's doing, he's pushing a reset button on all of creation. That's coming where there'll be a new heaven, it says here in verse 1. A new heaven and a new earth. We're talking universe wipe new. Just as sin impacted all creation when death entered the world, that's the entropy, God is now dealing with the effects of this. By the way, this is referenced in other verses for those that like to take notes. Uh, Isaiah 51 verse 6 talks about this. Matthew 24 35 talk about this. 2 Peter 3, 12 to 13 talk about this. It's, it's something that you've seen throughout Scripture is that there's coming a day. And it's encouraging to me because you look at the world and you see the brokenness and you go, I'm so glad that God's going to, this is not forever. It's for a set period of time and then God's going to make it right again. And I say again because when he made everything in the beginning, right? When he made everything in the beginning, there was no sin. It was, it was there. He's basically doing away with all that sin. Uh, it's essentially a purging of the effects of sin, instituting an afterstate of purity, abundance, life. Verse 2 talks about this massive city. Okay, so we got this new heaven, new earth, and now all of a sudden this massive holy city. We'll, talk, we'll look at the size here uh, in, the, in the next couple sections, a couple sections from now. And we see this massive city descending on earth from the presence of God in heaven. We'll talk more about this later. Verse 3, I heard this, this loud voice announces, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, right? And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Notice, church, notice the wording here. When it says the tabernacle, by the way, anytime you see tabernacle, it's and it's translating it into the English. It's the dwelling place. That's why our church is named that, okay? So the tabernacle of God is, the, is literally the dwelling place of God, and that's what he's talking about here. God is going to tabernacle with his people. He's going to dwell with the people, meaning proximity, meaning like, come on in, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, come on in, hanging around us in his presence, immersed in the presence of God, right? No more will there be a physical separation between God and man. No more will there be a spiritual separation between God and man. His very presence 
will be amongst his people. He will tabernacle. He will be the dwelling place. Now, these are remember, these are all who are resurrected. We are in our new bodies at this point. If you're born again, if you're a born again Christian, you've given your life to Jesus, your sins have been, rem, there's remission of sins. You are part of that new heavenly body is, is, part, is, is you, right? That new, I'm sorry, part of that new creation is you having those new heavenly bodies. Um, and I, I praise the Lord for that, right? That God makes all things new by bringing perfect fellowship with him. Notice his end game here. The end game for God is what, guys? It's fellowship with us. It's not, I'm God, you're not, bow to me. I'm angry with you. I'm happy with you. I'm angry. With you. Like That's a human mindset. Look at what God's doing here. He's paving a way for us to have perfect fellowship with the creator of the universe. Wow. Like We don't even know how amazing that's going to be. We can kind of like maybe start to think about, well, that's, you know, what was that? Gonna, you know, maybe catch a glimpse of it. <laughs> but God makes all things new by bringing perfect fellowship with him. That's his end game. That's why he has to deal away with sin. And that's why he's wait, he waits so long. And that's why he's waiting now because there's more people that are going to come to him. I know people that have accepted the Lord this week. How awesome is that? God's saying, hold on, hold on, there's more to come. And he's looking ahead to this day here that we're just referencing. In the, it's in the future, but he's looking ahead into that. He already sees this day as if it were today. And he goes, hey, I can't wait to have fellowship with her and him. My son, my daughter, my daughter. Right? He's, he wants that, and he wants that perfect fellowship. And he's going to be, once he gets everybody in, and he's going to deal away, get away with all this junk and make it new, man. And it's the way it's meant to be. It's what our heart craves, isn't it? As a believer, doesn't your heart crave that? No more pain, no more sorrow. No, we're going to look at that in a second. And just fellowship, perfect fellowship with him. You ever pray and your thoughts wander? Or you fall asleep? No more of that. <laughs> no more of that. You're not going to have to worry about that. Heck, you won't be worrying, period. For you worriers out there. <laughs> no more worry. You don't have to because you're amidst God's presence. How comforting that is, man. It's cool. Let's read on. Verse 4. Look at this, guys. Look at the tender heart of God. Remember, this is the same God who just wiped out like most of the earth. So he's perfectly judge. He's the perfect judge. And his wrath is justified. But he's also perfectly merciful and gracious. And look at his heart, tender heart, towards his kids. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, this is God speaking, of course, the throne. Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen, right? God makes all things new. That declarative statement that he makes. Amen to that. No more death. That's what it says. No more death. Every, wipe away every tear. There should be no more death. Our bodies will no longer decay. There's no more sickness or disease. We won't get sick. We don't have to worry about getting sick because there is no more sickness. No more cancer. In its place, in the place of these things, will only be abundance of life. That's cool, man. Abundance of life. Full of energy. If there's sleep, you'll wake up and feel refreshed. I say if there's sleep because the only reason we need sleep technically is because our body needs time to repair and reset. I'm guessing we probably won't need to sleep. In its place, we will only have an abundant life full of energy. We'll have ability, clarity of thought. We'll have just this... Wouldn't it be nice... Here's New bodies, right? And if God restores creation, even if he puts it back to kind of maybe like 
pre-fall days. The oxygen content was stronger here. People's energy levels are there. You've got, you're, like, like Adam was able just to probably run flat out for 30 miles. Just tuk, 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 tuk. I mean, like, we're going to, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm thinking human side of things, right? The hum, humanistic way. But, like, there's going to be these amazing things that we're going to do. Heck, maybe we can fly. Who knows? Maybe we teleport. <laughs> Jesus appeared, remember, when we read the, when Luke? He appeared to them when they were having their prayer time. He's like, hey, peace and be, peace and be still. <laughs> Right? But it's so cool. No more death. No more death. Only abundance. Only abundance. Death is, is terrible. And that's why it hurts so much. That's why we, death hurts us so much when we see it and we experience it. Because that's not part of God's plan. Why would God, why would God cause that? He doesn't. He's fixing it, though. No more meat. We'll get there in a second. <laughs> I mean, amazing. There's no more death, only abundance. And then it says here, look at this. Uh, There's no sorrow, verse 4. No more sorrow. When your heart grieves, you won't be grieving anymore. You're in the presence of God. There's no place for grief. You are immersed in love. (laughs) You know? You ever... You ever sorrowful sometimes? You're frustrated or something, and, and a song comes on and it kind of gets you out of it, right? Or you're kind of in a bum, bad mood, and you like you watch a comedy or something on shows, like you know that, that's something that my wife likes. She likes. She likes to laugh, right? So then laughter. All of a sudden, like nothing's really changed, but I feel better because like I just it, like, it kind of sh- shifted everything. If we can see that, like how our circumstance can change, how our emotions can change based on just a little thing like that. Imagine being in the presence of Jesus <laughs> and getting a hug from him. <laughs> it won't take very long for you just to be like, I'm, I don't need to go there anymore, man. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. You know, No more sorrow. Your emotional fears, doubts, struggles, weaknesses are gone in this new resurrected body. Gone. How cool is this? New creation, man. Depression, anxiety, worry, more. They're all replaced with joy, love, peace, acceptance, unity, fellowship, oneness. What else is it? It says, uh, no more crying, verse 4. No more crying. And it doesn't, that's not God going, hey, stop crying. <laughs> no, there's no more, there's no crying in heaven. <laughs> there's no crying in baseball. There's no place for tears as life has been made perfect in him. How can you cry? How can you cry in the presence of the Lord? I mean, we can we see that now if we were there, right? But we're in a flawed state here. We're in a broken state. Guess what we want? That's why we would cry, right? Because we know we're broken. <laughs> I'm broken. Well, you're not going to be broken forever. You've got the new body. This is going to be only good. Ah, it's going to be so awesome. We don't even know. This is, in many ways, a restoration, like I said, of the creation of the universe. But now this new kingdom is filled with those who have been forgiven, redeemed. They've, they've chosen God. Right? We've been cleansed. That means the worship is off the hook. Right? Like you... Right now, like when we, when we worship, even now, like, right? Like we just, we had our... When I say worship, I mean, obviously worship is more than just songs, but um, we spent, what, four songs in worship, right? Even then, like, you know, I know, like some of you had thoughts and you're like, what you have to do today? I get it. Yeah, I'm not going to show our hands. <laughs> you know, some of you might have thought, yeah, just, just even for a moment, you might have been like, Wah. or, you know, like, oh, and you get like messed up, oh, the slide didn't change in time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, there's this, this, these disconnects, right? Oh, I don't know, but there's a, that's our flesh. Eventually, that's gone, right? All of that's gone. And now we're able to worship in full spirit and truth. No restrictions, man, right? You're going to be freed up from those distractions, freed up from that, even from that callousness. Sometimes we can have a callousness towards worship. I had that for years, years. I've talked to you guys about this, right? And now here I am, the one playing. 
so stupid. It's not stupid. It's crazy how, how that God can work like that. He softens. He shaves off our callousness, you know, because it's not good. We should open our mouths and praise Him. We should worship Him. We should have a heart to do that, you know. Sing like nobody's watching, man. You know, one on one, audience of one. But that's gonna. Ha- that's our flesh that it gets in the way. It's our flesh. That's gone. That's gone. There's no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There's just pure worship, man. That's God's plan. It's still His plan. It always was His plan. He knew this before creation even happened. Before He started all this, that was His plan. You were part of His plan. If you're a born-again Christian, you were part of His plan. He saw you. And He says, you're worth it. I'm going to the cross for you. God is faithful God is true, verse 5 there. God is faithful, he's true. God's heart is to restore that which was lost in the fall. I make all things new. Write these words, write for these words are true and faithful. He's like, hey, you can take that to the bank, man. You could take that to, I will make all things new. By the way, you look it up in the Greek, all means all. <laughs> okay? All. There's no, by the way, there's no place for shame in heaven. Shame is gone too. I think that might have been for somebody. God is glorified and we are blessed as God makes all things new. God gets glorified in this because you start to think like, why would God do all this? Like thousands of years of earthly history just to bring, what is going on here? God gets glorified even more. Think about this, how much more glory he gets not because he's a glory hog, like he's egotistical. It's just he's worthy. He's worthy of it. How much glory he gets when his people come to, they're in a fallen state, they turn from sin and turn to him in worship of the creator God and learn how to walk with him in a fallen world. Praise you, Lord, right? When we see and we look back and like, Lord, you forgive a man like me who's done awful things, and still struggles with doing things wrong, right? Glory. I'm not worthy. Some people say, I just don't feel worthy. You're not worthy. None of us are worthy. If we were worthy enough, we didn't need Jesus. That's the whole point. We're unworthy. There's one who is worthy, Jesus. There's one. That's it. And thankfully, we have his righteousness, his grace, is given to us through his sacrifice on the cross. God is glorified. We're blessed as God makes all things new. I'm glad for the newness, man. Bring it on, (laughs) right? Bring it on. I can't wait. Friendly reminder, if you've got questions, text those in. Number is on the screen. Look at verse 6. I love this. Verse 6, God said to me, it's done. (laughs) I'm going to pause there for just a second. There's a point in time when the battle, the battle, the cosmic battle between good and evil, between light and dark, the cosmic battle is going to be done. (sighs) Right? No more, you know, evil strings pull, playing in, the, in politics. <laughs> no more manipulation of legislation to, you know, institute a, a, a corrupt, uh, corrupt uh, laws and whatnot. You know, no more struggle with sin inside yourself. None of that stuff, right? This, it's going to be done. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God declares in verse 6 there his sovereignty over all creation. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the... It's like I'm A to Z. I'm everything from A to Z, baby. I'm the, the beginning and the end. 
I am everything. All of, everything ha- lives and breathes and has its life because of God. He holds all things together. And notice the intimacy here in, in verse 7. Notice this. He who overcomes shall what? What's your Bible say? Inherit. Guys, you have an inheritance. You know who has inheritance? Kids. You get an inheritance from your, your parents, right? When you're on Team Jesus, you have an inheritance. And we're not talking about like, oh man, like my bank account is like, it's going to be fat. Okay, no. It, it, I mean, yes, metaphorically, but it's what you get is far greater than what money can buy. That's the cool thing. You're going to inherit perfect peace. You're going to inherit perfect joy. How cool is this? He who overcomes this crappy world shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he will, shall be my son or daughter. Notice that, that statement right there. Something we can glaze past that. That's a relationship there, man. I will be your father in proximity. I will be your father, my daughter. You'll be your father, my son. We're going to be good. Like, we're cool. There's nothing in between us. How neat is that? Just go have coffee with Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. It's not enough of them to go around, right? It's like, does he multiply himself? I don't know how that works. But anyway, <laughs> take a number. I'm like, dang it. I'm like 1,679,000,000. <laughs> The intimacy there, they receive this inheritance, this sonship or daughtership, which denotes family and closeness and relationship. How precious that is. That's part of this newness. Conversely, look at 8. It's so sad. It's tragic. Verse 8, conversely, those who die in their sins, they're not family. It lists out some of those there. The unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, etc., 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 It's not meant to be a complete list. It's meant to say, like, hey, these people are not family. These are not my family. These are not my children. They've rejected me. They are not my children. They do not have an inheritance. They're not here anymore. God makes all things new for his kids, which stresses the importance of being his kid. (laughs) to be saved. This is why we share the gospel, guys. We want people to have this. He's like, which which one do you want? Do you you want to be seen through grace or through the law? Because the law will smack you, right? And show you that you're a sinner. And now, what are you going to do with that? You're going to reject? A lot of people do. Most people reject this. It's the minority of people that are going to be making it. But God makes all things new for his kids. Let's keep going. Verse 9. I'll pick up the pace here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone like a jasper stone clear as crystal also she had a she the city had a great and high wall with 12 gates 12 angels at the gates names written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel there are three gates on the east three gates on the north three on the south three on the west verse 14 now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb and he who walked, who he, he who talked with me, John saying, had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, this new Jerusalem, in the new heaven, new earth. Its length is as great as its breadth. So it's a square. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Um, We'll pause there for just a second. So we're like, okay, furlong, <laughs> right? It's like, what the heck is a furlong? Um, I converted it into miles, and that's what—that's the size of it. Just to give you an idea. 
I'm not saying it's going to rest over the United States, for the record. Okay, there's a there's going to be a new heaven, new earth. There is no more. There's no more nations. <laughs> okay, nations, all that doesn't matter anymore. It's just in Christ. <laughs> um, but just to give you an idea for the size. It's about about 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Like it's cube, right? That's kind of what it's showing there. It's kind of cool to see that there. Let's continue on here, verse 18. The construction of this wall was of jasper. Oh, verse 19. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, uh, the fourth emerald, sidonic, sardius, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysophase, jacinth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was what? What? Pure gold like transparent glass. Just to be clear, concrete in heaven is gold. <laughs> the con what we would use as asphalt, gold. It's common. It's like it's, it kind of makes us kind of go, why why do we obsess over gold anymore, you know? <laughs> it's like that's gonna be that's it's like wearing concrete rings. Come on. It's commonplace in heaven, right? So cool. Um, I, have a sh I have a short video on these stones. Um, I shared a little bit about this in regards to uh, what happens when you share shine light on certain of these stones. Um, let's just watch this. I, I won't uh, attempt to talk too much about it here, but let's listen. Jerusalem, it said, is built made up of 12 precious stones that we would make into jewelry now. Now, here's the fascinating thing, which to me is the final proof that that book is the Word of God, that it must be God inspired. In the last generation only, we've discovered how to make purer light than we had before. Most light is bouncing around, waves crashing into each other, going in all directions, so that the light coming from that spotlight still lights this side of my face by reflecting off that, that tinsel up there. Um, we're used to light coming at us from all directions. But we've now discovered how to send light in one direction. Laser light is the most common. You've seen laser light beams straight as a die. But we've also got what we call cross-polarized light. A polarized filter, if you can imagine, allows light through like that. But if you put another polarized filter at right angles to that, you've really got a very fine filter. If you take sunglasses and take one lens and put it at right angles to the other, it goes even darker. It only lets very straight light through. Now, people have taken jewels and precious stones and cut a very thin slice for microscopic purposes and then shone cross-polarized light through them to see what happens, to put it very crudely, what happens to these precious stones in pure light. And one of two entirely different things <coughs> happens with every jewel. The technical term, I'll give you a bit of science for a moment, is anisotropic jewels and isotropic jewels. Now what happens is this, some jewels in pure light Whatever their color to begin with, they may be red, blue, or green, turn into all the colors of the rainbow and the most fantastic patterns. Other precious stones in pure light lose all their color, just go black, look like a lump of coal dust. And it's only in the last, this generation that people have discovered this unusual property. For example, diamonds in pure light and nothing. Did you get that, ladies? They're Did not even... that? Diamonds, nothing. nothing. They won't be there. <laughs> no, so make the most of them here. <coughs> Rubies, uh, garnets, just lose everything. Emeralds. No, they keep it. Oh, good. 
There are other stones that are anisotropic and go into these beautiful colors. Now here's the fascinating thing. The 12 precious stones that God uses to build the New Jerusalem are all anisotropic. In pure light, they are all far more beautiful. And God doesn't touch the diamonds or the rubies. He doesn't build with us. No, let's just put on the screen a picture of these stones. Yeah. Look at the top 12 stones on this picture and you'll see the stones of the New Jerusalem. Look at the four bottom ones at the bottom of the picture and you'll see they're black, no attraction, whatever. Now then, who knew this 2,000 years ago? No scientist knew it, nobody knew it. John the Apostle writing the, down the book of Revelation as the Lord dictated it to him, he didn't know. Nobody knew except one person in the entire universe, and he knew, and that was God himself. Where is that written exactly? Revelation 21, right. halfway through, and you'll find all the 12 stones listed there. And you can just imagine from the picture we've seen on the screen how beautiful the new Jerusalem is going to be. No need for do-it-yourself decoration or changing rooms there. No need. The materials that God uses will be fabulous. From verse 19, 21 right. verse 19. Read them out. Uh, the first foundation was Jasper. Yeah. The, uh, the, the second, Sapphire. The third, Chalcedony. The fourth, Emerald. The fifth, Sarno uh, Sardonyx. The sixth, uh, Carnelian. The seventh, Chrysolite. The eighth, Beryl, the ninth, Topaz, the tenth, Chrysoprase, or Chrysoprase, Chrysoprase, the eleventh, Jacinth, and the twelfth, uh, the twelfth, Amethyst. No diamonds, no rubies, no garnets, because they're, an, they're isotropic. Mm. Now, isn't that amazing? To me, that one thing alone would prove that the Bible was inspired by God, because nobody could have known this. They didn't know it until our generation. But there it is. So if you imagine that then, so like you've got, well, and we'll, we'll cover in just a second, this next section, the light source that's going to be shining the light, right? And there's going to be pure light. And so these even just the foundation just gleaming. So you just you start to picture like this new heaven, new earth. Like, it's, like I mentioned last week, talked about expanding our vision into seeing all different, you know, the entire spectrum of light. I mean, I, sounds, smells, tastes, all kinds of cool stuff, right? Just the beauty of it. You got this new Jerusalem gleaming. The streets are paved with gold, for crying out loud. Like this is gorgeous, right? And just It just reflects, what is it? What is it just like, is God all into bling? Is that it? Like, so you just, you know, <laughs> we get up there and Jesus has grills, you know, he's like, what's up? <laughs> you know, it's, it, he, it, these things are beauty. Beauty glorifies God. That's just really what it is. Beauty glorifies God. That's why he's making all things new. And he gets rid of the impurities. He gets rid of the sin. He gets rid of all of that stuff. The mar even the marks of sin. He gets rid of, and he makes all things new because he's glorified in such things. And when God makes all things new, it's amazing. It's amazing, and we just we can even start to see like how it could be, like you know, with the science, right? Just like this, this light, just this light, the pure light shining through these stones. Wow, amazing! I'm glad my birthstone's up there, sapphire. Yeah, rocking it. <laughs> anyway. Topaz, all right, okay, right. Topaz is better, yeah, right. <laughs> Topaz is up there too, yeah, man. Verse 22. Notice this. Remember, New Jerusalem, okay? There's still a planet, okay? It's not just this, you know, box sitting there. Okay, there's also a planet, but I saw, this is talking about New Jerusalem. Verse 22, he's, he, John writes, he says, I saw no temple in this New Jerusalem, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no, remember, the millennial period has a, has a temple built. Those are for the offerings, special offerings in, from animal, of animal offerings, right? Worshipful uh, sacrifice, okay? But now there's, there's going to be a point in time where the temple is completely done away with. There's going to be, it's going to be completely done away with, 
Okay? There's no further need because God's presence is there. His very presence is there. There's no need for it. The city had no need for a son. Look at that, verse 23. The city has no need for a sun or the moon to shine in it. Why? For the glory of God illuminated it. The lamb is its light. And we're not talking about a lamb rolling in that's a glowing lamb, okay? We're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about God himself being the light. Whoa, that's cool. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory and honor and nations into it, they sh they, but there shall be by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The sun and moon aren't even needed anymore. The reason we need that is because there's darkness. It's going to do away with darkness. I don't even know what that's going to be like. Is it just like varying degrees of light or something? There's not going to be any more night. This is, this is meant to be, this is God's plan. He knew this would happen before he even started making anything. This is going to be a utopia for those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Right? It's only for, it's, it's for his kids only. Those who are saved, those who are born again. That's why this is so important. The alternative is everlasting lake of fire, right? I mean, it's stark contrast, right? This is tragically, again, like I mentioned, this is going to be a minority of people all throughout history. Um, the cool thing is you guys have the privilege of being able to share the gospel and let people know how to come into the kingdom, right? <laughs> Sin separates us from God. Jesus paid for sins on the cross and he demonstrated the forgiveness and grace that comes through that by resurrecting himself from the dead. You need to place your faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. When you do, you're in. You're on team Jesus. There's the gospel, guys. There it is. Easy. Make it your own. Have it be your own words as long as it ma matches the, <laughs> the concepts. We've got to repent and turn from sin, turn to Jesus, receive forgiveness, right? Okay, but like, have that Share that with people. Share that with your friends. Share that with your neighbors. Share that with your fam with your um, your family and 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 all all these different things. Your coworkers, talk to people about this. Talk to them about this. If they're not believers, sharing with them doesn't make them more a not believer. Like they're already doomed. <laughs> talk with them. God makes all things new. Notice this, guys. I hope you notice this. God makes all things new to have his dwelling place with his people. He wants this. You guys get that? He wants to hang out with you. I don't get that. Like, me? I'm not some egotistical, oh, yeah, me. I, I can see why you'd want to hang out with me. <laughs> I'm pretty cool. He loves you. He loves you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to spend time with you now. That's why when I say, hey, you should be reading your Bible every day, you should be praying every day, yes, that's true. But don't turn that into a religion. Read my Bible, prayed, uh, 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 uh. I'm good. It's good to do those things, absolutely. You should do those things, yes. Why, though? Spend time with Jesus. You should be spending time with, time with Jesus. And the people that do it look different, right? And when we do it, when you do it, you feel different. Your mindset's different. What comes out of your mouth is different. What you want to look at is different. What you want to do is different. God's awesome. This is He wants to maximize that in here in the end. He gives us a new body. He makes a newness. He does away with all the junk. And now there's perfect fellowship with him. And he's like, so talk to me. What's going on? Let's explore this new creation. Let's, 
Let's, ha- let's enjoy fellowship and let's be free. Right? That's cool. God wants to, God makes all things new to have his dwelling place with his people. It's powerful. He will tabernacle with us. He will have his dwelling place with us. So here's uh, just a couple quick things, and then uh, well, if anybody has any questions, we'll go through that. But if you're wanting, if you're needing, I move from want to need. If there's a party that needs to have some newness in an area of your life, okay, maybe it's maybe it's a sin that's clinging to you. Maybe you're in bondage and you can't. You just can't seem to break free from it. Maybe it's a way of thinking, a way of feeling, all those different things. You need newness. Maybe it's emotional healing. Maybe it's pain, emotional pain, mental pain. Maybe it's forgiveness for yourself. Maybe it's forgiveness for somebody else. And you need that newness of life in you. You need that newness. You need, you need God to help make it new. Well, this is, these are some action steps for you. First and, first and foremost, number one, you have to put your hope in the Lord. There's lots of self-help books out there. Matthew, I remember you talking about this at one point. I'm like, ah, I was a big on the self-helps. It doesn't get you there. It gets you close to there, maybe a little toe over as far as change goes. But what's it based on? It's based on your ability to do it. Well, I've got news for you. I don't think it's new, new news because I think you've all experienced it. Your best efforts will always fall short, 100%. You can bank on that. (laughs) We need to have the Lord make all things new, right? So if you need that newness in your life, you want that, you desire that, oh, I can't do it, correct. Recognize you can't do it. Absolutely, own that. Lord, I can't do this. I need you to do it. I can't fix this relationship. I can't fix this thinking. I can't fix this pattern of behavior. I can't fix whatever that is, okay? Lord, it's got to be you. I need you to speak newness. I need you to breathe newness into this. Place your hope in the Lord. That's what he does. That's his heart. You're in alignment with his will. Bow to him, first and foremost. That's the first thing you do. By the way, don't think of that as, it's obviously there's a first time for salvation, but I'm not even just speaking about salvation. Yes, that, but even more so that we need to have that lifestyle that we keep being dependent on him. Jesus said in John 15, 5, abide in me and I in you, right? I'm the vine, you're the branches. A man abides in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Remember, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So he's like saying, hey, I want to breathe that newness in you. I want you to produce that fruit. But if you try to do it apart from me, then you won't be able to do it. You'll just die. And we experience that. That's why it's important to read your Bible and pray and be in fellowship and all these different things. Because if you don't do that, you've detached yourself from the vine and you're going to wither up and die. You can't do it on your own. You're not designed to do it on your own. So you need to make sure that you are embracing the newness of God by surrendering to him, putting your hope in him. Number two, grow in your relationship with God. Grow. You should be growing. If you look back six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, are you different? Are you growing? I hope so. I hope so. Stay connected to Jesus. You need to be growing in a relationship with God. Otherwise, you won't experience the newness. Some people say yes to Jesus, but then they live their life however they want to do. And it's like, no. Then I, then I start to question, did you really mean it then? You can't say, yeah, forgive me of my sin, and then just jump right back into sin again. Or, yeah, I love you, Lord, but then you never crack your Bible, like ever? Really? You're not going to pray? You're not going to put worship music on? You're not going to, like, th- shouldn't there be growth, right? If we're a new, the Bible says, you're a new creation created in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says, right? You are a new, behold, you're a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. What's he talking about there? What's he talking about? He's talking about this newness, this this newness that's happening as we continue our walk with him. There is a relationship that changes as we grow. We are meant to grow with him. He doesn't want you to stay just like a little spiritual baby. Babies need what? 
They need to be fed milk. They poop their pants. They pee their pants, right? They whine, they cry, they complain. They're, they're, uh, uh, and they want everything about them. It's all about them and what they, what they want and when they want it. They don't get it. They, they throw a fit. He wants us to grow up to be mature. And I'll put it to you this way. A lot of immature Christians in the church, I would say especially the Western church, we are spoiled little brats. I was one of them for a while. You come to Christ, you think you're, you're God's best gift to himself. Yeah, I'm the team Jesus. I'm an all-star. No, you're not. You're a sinner saved by grace, dude. You brought debt. You brought baggage with you, by the way. <laughs> and you're like puking up on people. So like, let's grow with God, right? Grow with God, guys. Grow with him. Don't be complacent. It's good enough. Hey, I don't do those things anymore. There's always going to be somebody that you can look back at, look, look around at, and go, they're worse than me, so I'm doing okay. No, no, we are not called to compare ourselves to the worst of sinners. Well, I'm not like Hitler. I'm not doing those things. We're called to compare ourselves to who? Jesus Christ. Let us look to, to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. That's where our eyes are supposed to be fixed. Well, then, geez, when I do that, I'm like a... Correct. Now, he loves you. There's grace. And he wants, to, he wants to bring you to that. You're going to become whatever you set your eyes on. So don't look at your sin. Don't look at other people's sin. Don't look at what's wrong with the world. Look to him who's everything that's right. And let him breathe the newness into you in all situations. Who you are today then will not be who you are six months from now, and you will be better, better, better. Absolutely. Look at John. John's writing this when he's in his 90s. It's one of his most prolific works. He kept staying with me. He hung in there with God. Dude's under house arrest. Tried to be boiled in oil. Hated by people. Roman government goes, I don't know what to do with this guy. Let's put him on this island. In the, under, you know, put him on the island of Patmos. We want to just forget about him. Let him rot there. But his closeness with God was growing and growing and growing, right? So to receive the newness of God, you need to put your hope in him regularly. Grow in your relationship. And then nextly, walk in the grace of God. Learn to walk. We talked about that last week. Walk in the grace. Like, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to mess up. Hopefully not today, but probably by tomorrow. <laughs> Start of the work week, you know, whatever. It's probably going to happen. It's going to happen soon, right? You're going to say something, something, bleh, just a reminder that we are in these fallen bodies. Well, that's something that God wants to make new. And when you, when you have, walk in the grace. Don't shame yourself. Don't repent. Lord, I'm sorry. Help me not to be that man anymore. Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to not be that woman anymore. I want to honor you with my mind, my body. I want to honor you with what I say, what I look at, what I do, how I feel, all of those things. I want to honor you and walk in that grace. Let him lead you in those things. And if you get start to stray, come right back, man. God makes all things new, guys. Amen to that, right? And soon, the battle will be done. We will have to, there's no more fight anymore. There's no fight within. There's no fight without. It's just oneness with the Father, Creator, man. Cool. Really cool. Everything's going to function the way it works, the way it's supposed to work. Things aren't going to break. Have to do any repairs. Anyway. Amen.